As a Catholic growing up in the multicultural city of Toronto, I had always been curious to find out how our First Nations Catholic brothers and sisters lived out their spirituality. So when I had a chance to visit Edmonton, Alberta, where the fastest growing sector of the population is Aboriginal, I had a chance to explore the topic further. I'm Mary Rose Bacani. Join me today as I share with you what I explored for this episode of Catholic Focus. In Edmonton's inner city is a church that has the smell of burning sweet grass rather than incense, a 29-foot medicine wheel of life above the altar enclosing the crucifix, and a congregation made up of people from all walks of life, including the homeless and the struggling, who call this parish community their home. Sacred Heart, I would say, is first of all the first and only uh, Aboriginal church that has been designated as a national parish. And what that means is anyone that comes to Sacred Heart that is First Nations, Métis, and Inuit can be baptized, married, uh, buried, whatever, all the sacraments because they belong to this parish no matter where they live. But in Enoch, those who go to that church and those who are baptized and married, they have to live in Enoch. They're governed by land space where we're governed by culture. It's a place where even the young can learn about Jesus Christ. I come to church because so I could learn the way of Jesus, because he was loving and kind. Sacred Heart Church of the First Peoples has been the official parish for the Catholic First Nations peoples of Edmonton and its surrounding communities since the early 90s, when Archbishop Jordan McNeil of Edmonton designated it to be so. The documents from Vatican II very clearly allows us to decorate and to, um, however we can uh, help the people to see God. So therefore for Aboriginal people, it's to have the symbol, the, the medicine wheel on, at the front of the church, uh, the blanket on the altar and, and using a blanket to give their communion and, and different little things that we do to help them to say that they are good and that this church belongs to them. Now if you look at the Old Testament, in the early days the Jewish people were nomads and they roamed the country. And so they, our Aboriginal people at one time were nomads. And so what held them together, the Israelites together, would hold Aboriginal people together. So a lot of you, you have to have ceremonies, you have to have traditions that keep them together and keep them proud. And many of our people converted to the, the Christian faith and converted to the Roman Catholic Church, but they held on to their traditions because the traditions is part of their language, part of their, their being. The sacred circle and the medicine wheel are two symbols central to native spirituality. These are symbols that emphasize so strongly how the First Nations people respect life, Mother Nature, and God the Creator. In most Aboriginal communities, they will have a medicine wheel. The colors may change, but it's the four colors of the four people in the world. There's a, a, a very lengthy teaching with this. That, you know, like there's four seasons in the year, there are four times in a day, there's four times in our life. And in each of the, uh, of the seasons, uh, each of the four directions, there is an animal, there's a medicine. But here, we symbolize it we, mainly that the four kinds of people. There's the Aboriginal people, which is the red, then the yellow is our oriental cousins. And then only because we are Cree country do we use navy blue, but most communities use this black for our African uh, relatives. And then of course for our white relatives, the Caucasians, we have white. This, we welcome them on the inside and we welcome them as family because we're all created by the same creator. And so therefore we're one people, one family. The artwork in the church underneath the medicine wheel also reflects the integration of their native spirituality with the Christian understanding of God. This artwork is called the Dance of the Eagle, or it could be the Dance of God, because in the Aboriginal community, the eagle is the symbol of God. We have the woman who is dancing in the sacred circle, and we see the symbols of the four directions. In her cloak, there are 12 feathers representing the 12 disciples, 
In the woman's hair, there's one feather, and that symbolizes that she is available, and that symbolizes for us in the Christian faith that Jesus, of Jesus, and Jesus is available. And then we have here in the man, also dances in the sacred circle, and the symbols, once again, the four colors of the, of the uh, medicine wheel is here. And in his right hand, he has an eagle fan, which symbolizes that he is the protector, he is the guard. And then in his left hand, he has the shepherd's crook, which for the natives in the prairies, that would represent the buffalo, which is also a symbol for God as well. And you see the crook at the top symbolizes the hump on the, the buffalo. But for us Christians, this would be the good shepherd, symbolizes the good shepherd. Then the one in the middle is always everyone's question. As he was doing the small little sketches to get prepared to do the big paintings, um, he was going to wrap this child in a blanket. And when he looked at the sketch, he looked as if an angel was holding the child. You have the angel here, and this is the arm holding the child, and then this is the wing. The teachings with this, and with Native people, art is a teaching. We have both women and men, and they produce children. But it needs the spirit, it needs the Creator to make that a family. And the same thing in the parish, we have men and women and we have lots of children. But it takes the spirit, it takes the angel to make this a family. And we consider this parish as a family. And that's very important as when we look at this. With the native symbols merging with Christian beliefs, the stage is set for the worship of God. As the Eucharistic liturgy begins, the congregation prepares themselves for worship with what they call smudging. The smudging is very similar to what we use incense in any Catholic church. It's, it's uh, made mostly of sweetgrass, sage, tobacco, and cedar, which are the four medicines of the four directions. And it's to, uh, it's to bring harmony in the building. So before the service, the sweetgrass carrier will smudge the building and leave it at the back for people to smudge as they come in. And then we smudge the, the offerings to bring harmony, that those offerings are coming in good faith and will bring harmony to the parish. You're telling God, that you're going to pray. And when the sweet grass is burning, we know that the prayers go up with the, the smoke. We know that they, it ventures to God. It journeys to God. And to me, at that moment, when you're blessing yourself, you are very close to God, we believe. You're, you're that much closer because of that exercising of that tradition of our, or of that way of praying. Within the liturgy, the whole congregation prays to all four directions. When we have the four directions, do the four directions as part of the Mass, it is to pay homage to the Creator who has created all of the directions. And just as in the medicine wheel we have the four sections, we have four directions. We first go to the east, and then we go to the south, we go to the west and the north, and we end up by giving thanks to the Creator and to, to uh, to the mother, mother Earth and to Father Son. And this is to show respect that, that the God who we all pray to, whether we are native or non-native, created this universe. And that we are only just an element, but we are all connected. Everything is connected in this universe. And that we are part of that connection and part of that creation. The First Nations community values human relationships, respect for elders, learning about the traditional way and preserving their language. We always have a, an elder or someone to come and pray in the beginning of the Mass as the opening prayer and at the end of the Mass. As today we had Emily to pray in Cree, uh, Eva Ladisura prayed in Cree, and then sometimes we have them from the north, they will pray in Dine Ta, or from the south, the Bloods will pray. It's one of the emphasis, the reason we do this is because I think it's so important that we emphasize that their language is important. And the one thing beautiful about Emily is that her grandmother nor her mother speaks Cree. And she has gone to St. Uh, Francis of Assisi School, which they have Cree immersion from kindergarten up. And she has learned her language and she's teaching her family their language. By having them to say the prayer in their language, it helps them to recognize that it is a value and that the church recognizes it as value. 
The way that the First Nations community values human relationships and connections with others is evident with a sign of peace during the liturgy. And when you offer the sign of peace, it's just not turning around in the pew and just shaking one person's hand and looking back up front. You walk around and you go hug people and you tell them and you mean it from your heart. You know, peace be with you. Don't take that lightly. You know, you offer something, you're trying to connect with that person. We never know who may need that hand. We may never know who may need that hug. We don't know who's having a bad day. But we have to venture out and make sure when somebody's hand reaches for yours, that you reach out for theirs. And that's the connectiveness. We just don't know how that will work. But we've got to trust God that it will. Sacred Heart Church of the First Peoples is not the only place in Edmonton where Native people can preserve their language and culture. According to the magazine Today's Parent, Ben Calfrobe St. Clair School in the Edmonton Catholic School Board is one of Canada's top 20 schools of 2009. It's a one-of-a-kind school with 160 students made up mostly of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. In fact, some of them are the same people you'd see at Sacred Heart Church. One of our greatest uh, joys is to be able to find the, the complementary nature of the two faith traditions and look at how they both augment each other so nicely. They learn various things about their culture, the dancing, the jigging. They go out and teach them some of the things, the ways that they have to do, and the drumming and the singing. And I think that that's very important for my kids. Ben Kafrobe is a Blackfoot elder who was a staunch advocate of education being a means to setting people free. He became one of the namesakes of this school. Sinclair Vassisi is an Italian Catholic saint who dedicated her life to Christ by serving the poor. She became the other namesake. So the name Ben Kafrobe St. Clair expresses the duality of the nature of the school. And today, this school remains the only strictly First Nations, Métis, and Inuit program in the Edmonton Catholic School Board. The symbolism that we have uh, is slightly different than what they would see in a, in a, in a regular Catholic school. Uh, in each of our classrooms, one of the things that, uh, that we've done is we've had uh, an integration uh, symbol uh, painted over each door. You'll notice in each of the parts of our building that there is a medicine wheel that is enmeshed with a uh, cross. And on, on the most basic level, what that indicates to people is that we learn from the medicine wheel, but we also learn from our Catholic tradition. I, I think the most natural way that we integrate both of our faith traditions is, is through the medium of prayer. Uh, and prayer in, in itself is such a universal faith practice. When we pray, uh, we pray in many different ways. Uh, the, we say our traditional morning prayers are our Catholic prayers. Often we pray not simply to God, but we look at the greater embodiment of Creator. My cultural background is from the um, Métis culture. I am from originally from the Kikino Métis settlement. I think by being Aboriginal myself, it lends um, a good role model to my students who come from the First Nations Métis and Inuit background. I enjoy working with them because the culture um, connects and I'm able to share what I've been taught as a Métis child with the students I teach today. Uh, in our classrooms when our children pray, uh, we also use the traditional practice of the smudging ceremony as we pray. When we celebrate, uh, we celebrate with our Catholic priests, but we also celebrate with our Aboriginal elders. And uh, each of our celebrants brings a different flavor uh, to the nature of our celebration itself. We have a picture of Jesus here. And, and in, the, in the good book it says, he died for all of us. But we also have a picture of Mary, Jesus' mother, over there. Having our mother is also very important. And over there we have 
disciples and followers. Well, when the elders talk so about life, and they talk about love important. and kindness, Everything is very and they talk important. about funny episodes in life, and they talk about ceremonies, to me that's theology. They're, they're talking theology with each other. Much the same as two priests would talk theology to each other. We know that uh, we're always asking our children to see Christ in one another. And often it's very diff difficult for uh, students to see themselves in the face of Christ. One of the things that we've managed to do is acquire First Nations Catholic icons. And uh, we've just received them last week. And we are going to be gifting every classroom in the building with a First Nations image of the compassionate Christ and a First Nations envision of the uh, Madonna. And we're so delighted because for our children, they will now not only see Christ in one another, but they will be able to look at the face of Christ and see themselves. If we can rise and honor the drum, honor the prayer that took place here, honor the blessing of the icons, but above all, honor each other and honor yourself. The porcelain mosaic, 10 feet tall and 14 feet wide, stands on the south side of Holy Cross Cemetery in Edmonton. It is a tribute to forgotten souls, made by Wayne Ashley, who is a Cree artist. I created this monument to uh, dedicate the people buried in unmarked places, such as people that uh, fell asleep by uh, bridges, washed away other people that can't afford headstones, uh, for, uh, from being on social assistance. And the thought and the design of this was to represent uh, life and death, learning life's lessons from the beginning of life to when we actually die and the lessons learned in between. We have a large native population and many, many, many of them have chosen to be buried close to the trees on the property. So they're all in a similar area and again unmarked. So this is in the heart of that area now. So when they come, they feel a possessiveness. This is their area. It's their culture and their religion. So it has garnished a great deal of interest, not just from the native population, but from everyone. Ashley's works mix Christian and Aboriginal imagery. The front side of this mosaic, called Ascending, has images of the stages of human life, from infancy to adulthood, showing how one learns responsibilities and consequences of actions. At death, the soul leaves the body, and an angel brings her soul to the creator of all things. The back of Ashley's monument highlights the Christian symbol of the cross. And this is the creator of life, all living things. It is known to a lot of people, they call him God, the creator, and it's just a natural progression to give it respect. And the cross to me and the two crosses below represent that. Father Frank, you're the pastor here at St. Anne's Parish in Toronto, the parish that's been associated with the Native people since the early 1980s, I believe. Um, now tell me about um, this parish because this was the, an important location for World Youth Day 2002. When the World Youth Day organizations, uh, organization was thinking of how to welcome youth from all over the world, they chose this parish as the center for all Aboriginal Indigenous people, youth to meet. And so there was study sessions and prayer sessions that were held here. It's just extraordinary that we would have that as part of our history in this uh, parish, which is so um, multicultural right now and represents so many uh, people from all over the world, but especially the First Nations, the First Peoples that lived on this continent. I see that in this parish a very dominant symbol 
has to do with the four colors. Can you tell me a little bit about why that is and, and what that all means? The four colors uh, indicate the four directions, north, south, west, and east. I really should have begun with the east because we always begin our prayer facing the east. So each of the colors uh, is connected to one of the directions of the compass. Uh, the east is the uh, color yellow. And if you can think of the arising sun in the morning, bright yellow. So it's the beginning of the newness of life, the newness of a day, the start of life of infancy, for example. And we use that direction to uh, praise the Creator, thank the Creator for the gifts of the East. Then the, uh, the next direction would be that of the South. And the red color is sort of the color of fire, of warmth, of, of heat. And it's the warmth that comes from the South that not only brings warmth to Mother Earth, and brings about the life of Mother Earth, but also is the color of compassion, of the heart uh, on fire with love. And so it's the direction of the passion of youth, for example. So our prayer is directed towards Creator to evoke those kinds of realities of everyday life. The uh, West, the color of the dark. The sun goes down, it becomes dark. It's the black. And it's the color of the end of life, the end of journey of life. It's um, the color of the doorway. It's the Western doorway to the life after this life, where the elders will uh, greet us and welcome us. It's the color of adulthood, where maturity brings about responsibility. And so we ask Creator to help us to be uh, responsible in our adult lives. The white is the color of the North. And for Canada, of course, it's the white of the snow. Uh, it's the white of the time when Mother Earth rests. It calls us to take time for rest as well so that we can have the proper rest that we need to live a fullness of the next day, the, the light of, in the light of the East that comes to bring us a new day. It's the color of the hair of the elders to listen to their wisdom, to be inspired by their experience of life. And also if you think of the four directions as I think of it, as the arms of Christ stretched out on the cross. Again, we have the East, and the west, the north, and the south, represented in the cross of Jesus. Uh, in our Eucharistic prayer, we talk about our prayer uh, stretching from east to west, the praise stretching from east to west. In our Roman liturgy, we use similar symbols about the directions of the earth to somehow express the omnipresence of Creator and the goodness of God's creation, the action of God loving us and giving us the creation in which we live. Now, Blessed Kateri Tekakwitha is the first native Christian to be declared a blessed by the church. Can you tell us a little bit about her? In our prayer for her canonization, we call her the Lily of the Mohawk. And um, she indeed was a Mohawk uh, native person. She um, was converted to Catholicism as she was very young, but very much rejected by her family and the rest of her, her people because of this conversion to Catholicism. She remained faithful and dedicated in spite of all of that. Um, she also had contracted smallpox when she was young, and so her face was very much disfigured as her body with scars from smallpox. Uh, in her teen, late teens, she moved to um, a native village near Montreal. She died very young, but there she was noted for her holiness, for her prayerfulness. And when she died and they prepared her body, they discovered that all of the uh, signs of the small hotpox had disappeared, which certainly people saw as an indication that God had blessed her uh, and uh, for the very fidelity that she showed in spite of maybe the rejection that she'd experienced as a young person. Obviously, she is for our native people a very important person who is part of their, uh, their culture and their, and their presence here in on this a continent. And that brings us to the end of today's show. I hope that this show has provided you with insight into our First Nations Catholic brothers and sisters' sense of connectedness and love of ritual and worship of God. So please send us any of your comments, insights, or if you'd like to order a DVD copy of this episode, send us an email. Focus at saltandlighttv.org. 
Once again, I'm Miros Bikani, your host. We'll see you next time.